<laughs> well, hey there, everybody, uh, and uh, welcome to yet another fall publishing webinar. I'm Chris Beatty's editor of Grower Talks and Green Profit Magazine, and I'm going to be your host for the uh, uh, next hour or so as we tackle the topic you see right there on your screen, perennial production pitfalls. And uh, it's a hot topic, especially judging from the uh, the tremendous registration numbers that I've been seeing. So we're probably standing room only right now in the uh, in the auditorium. So so uh, try to be try not to elbow the person next to you there because uh, it's pretty crowded. Uh, and how have I as I long ago established, I am I'm o- I'm only the expert on one thing, and that is finding experts. And um, we've got a good one for today's topic. She is I'm going to pop this slide up, but you don't need to see her picture because we have her live on camera today. She is Laura Robles, the trials manager for Walters Gardens in Zealand. Michigan. Welcome, Laura. Hi. Thanks, Chris. She's right there. Um, now, uh, Laura, one of the fun things about webinars is you can do them from anywhere, which is a good thing because you are never in the greenhouse. I don't even know how you find time to trial your trials. Where are you today? Uh, well, today I'm actually in Orlando, Florida, but um, most of the time I, you can find me in my greenhouse. Just these last few weeks have been a little busy going from place to place. So once Somebody. spring is done, I'll uh, should be home more. There you go. Somebody should have checked your schedule before they signed you up for the webinar, right? Hey, it's all good. Well, this works. I don't mind at all doing it from here. So ah, that's because otherwise you'd be in Zealand, Michigan, instead of Orlando. And exactly. interestingly, I'll, I'll be in Orlando tomorrow. So uh, hope I the weather's will be here. <laughs> and, and of course, you know who I am. I'm 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 still in West Chicago doing my my live broadcast thing here from the the um, uh, Ball Publishing Broadcast Center here in West Chicago. Um. Now, let's see, a couple of housekeeping things before I, and I don't want to waste any time because uh, you've got a lot to talk about. If you've got questions, you can find the, the question, the ask a question section, I think, on probably on the right-hand side of your screen. We've already got several coming in. In fact, I had some coming in like two days ago. I don't know how they got them in there, but people are excited about this, Laura. Yeah. <laughs> so if you've got questions, ask them. If they're, if they're um, of general interest and pertinent to the topic uh, that Laura happens to be on, We'll field them as we go along. Uh, if not, we'll try to get to them at the end. And if we can't get them then, um, we're going to give you Laura's email address where she'll, she said she'd be on call 24-7 to answer <laughs> your burning, perennial questions. And um, this webinar will be archived, as always, uh, if you have to leave, uh, can't finish it all, or want to watch it again or share it with your colleagues. GrowTalks.com slash webinars is the place as always. So uh, that said, Laura, you ready to take it away? I'm going to click over to uh, your opening slide and give you control of the webinar. All right. I'm ready. Thanks, Chris. Okay. Hey, everybody. So today I am going to talk about perennial production pitfalls. Um, My main focus on this is really going to be problems to look out for on especially diseases and pests and some of the other things that perennial growers tend to have issues with. And um, I thought this was a nice topic to talk about just because there's a lot of information out there on annuals, but it sometimes can be a little bit harder to find the same information when it comes to a perennial crop. There's just not quite as much information out there, not quite as much research that's been done. Uh, So just kind of um, gathering up some of the information and and putting it out there in a way that pertains to you guys growing perennial crops. Um, So little bit of an overview of what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to go over just a few best practices in general of ways to grow your product or maintain your greenhouse to try to avoid some of these problems in the first place. It's always easier to prevent than it is to control once you have a problem in place. Um, Also, just some of the most common issues to watch out for, some of the plants that are affected most by each of those, um, some signs and symptoms to look out for as you're, you know, meandering through your greenhouse and and looking at your crops and scouting. Um, And then I'll go over some prevention techniques, whether they are um, cultural things that you can do, variety selection things that you can do, um, and then also some chemical controls for um, each of them as as applicable. Uh, So first of all, kind of just general best practices. I'm sure uh, the majority of you all know this, but it's always good to refresh. And if there's any uh, growers watching that are newer to this, it's just good information to have. So um, 
basically in general, most crops are going to do best if you do allow somewhat of a dry down between waterings. Um, of course, this is going to be dependent on your crop. You have to know your crops. Don't try to grow something dry that's going to get wants to be kept more on the wet side. But in general, if you don't just keep stuff saturated and wet all the time and allow that kind of fluctuation between the, the moisture side down to the drier side, um, that can definitely help a lot, not only with just your overall crop performance and growth, but also with trying to keep or helping to keep root rots and stem rots, especially and crown rots at bay. Um, another just general good practice is to always try to irrigate earlier in the day, in the morning, if possible. Um, that gives the rest of the day for the crop to dry down. Um, you'll see as I go through a lot of these diseases on the next slides that a lot of them do um, spread most rapidly or sporulate most rapidly when there's either high humidity or free moisture on the plant surface. So if you go into um, night or cloudiness where they're going to stay wet a long time, that just maximizes your chances of having some of these diseases be able to spread and infect your plant material. So I know it's not always possible. You know, sometimes the sun comes out later in the day and all of a sudden you're scrambling to water your crops and that's fine. I mean, you've got to keep your crops irrigated, but just general best practice is try to do it in the morning. Um, and then the, the third thing is really to try to practice good sanitation protocol. Um, it takes time. Sometimes it's not easy to get in between crops and sanitize, but really it's in your best interest and the next crop's best interest to do so. Um, so when you're doing any maintenance, you know, trimming or pruning or whatever on your on your plants, it's really best to use gloves um, and then also to sanitize your tools and your um, hard surfaces, benching floors, whatever have you in between crops, if at all possible. You do want to try to get rid of the organic matter first because a lot of the sanitizing agents don't work as well if they have to um, or if they're applied over organic matter, some of that um, some of their action gets taken away trying to work at that organic matter and you want it to be able to focus on the pathogens um, and then also you know as you're potting up new material try to use clean pots and trays either if they're new or if you have some way to wash and sterilize them between crops um, those are really going to set you in a, a good place for your next crops So some of the commonly seen problems that I'm going to talk about, and of course there's more than this that are out there, but these are just some of the most common ones since we do have an hour. Um, gray mold or botrytis, leaf spots, root crown and stem rots, wilts, blights, mildews, uh, viruses and phytoplasmas, rust, bacterial gall, and then um, pests and some other issues at the end there. So first of all, gray mold or botrytis blight. So this is obviously a very common pathogen that's seen in greenhouses, not only on perennials, on pretty much everything. Um, it's, a, it's a fungal pathogen. It's actually caused by botrytis scenaria um, and also some other species. Um, you can see a little picture of a, like a microscopic image of the spores on the side there. Um, so botrytis can be very easy to recognize when it's sporulating because the spores cause that fuzzy gray mold look that's very easy to, to recognize and to diagnose, but it's not always so easy. It can also cause brown spotting on the flowers, brown spotting on the foliage. Um, and then of course, when it is sporulating, it is spread easily by, by being brushed against by people or animals or machinery or whatever have you. Um, also with watering, if splashing water will, um, will spread those spores. And also wind or, you know, air currents, if you've got HAF fans running inside your greenhouse area um, or vents open, that can all help to spread that pathogen. And it does have a very wide host range. There's really um, not anything that I at least know of that can't be affected by botrytis. Um, so this is one of those many pathogens that the spores do require high humidity and moisture levels to germinate. So... Another one where trying to go into the night or into cloudy weather with dry foliage is going to be in your best interest. Um, botrytis has a pretty wide temperature range where it is active. It's active all the way from about 32 degrees Fahrenheit on up to 80. So even um, if you're overwintering crops and you're in like a really cold greenhouse, you know, 36 degrees, 38 degrees, whatever, trying to overwinter your crops, botrytis is still going strong in there. So you really have to maintain active scouting for this crop at a wide range of temperatures. Um, Botrytis does have overwintering structures called conidia that do persist in soil and on plant debris. So another reason to clean up after your crops, because if you've had botrytis on a crop 
and there's leaves or different things that have dropped onto your floor or benching, um, they could be harboring some of those overwintering structures. Um, and the canidia also allow for survival of the pathogen um, during times of low moisture. So um, some of the commonly infected perennials that get botrytis would be peony, hosta, salvia, iris, rudbeckia, but really um, most anything that I know of can and will get botrytis if the conditions are right. So you can see some of the images that I included on the slide here. So the one on the far, uh, I guess that would be the right-hand side would be Veronica um, showing where it's actually been spoilating and you can see kind of that fuzzy gray look to it. Um, but then on the others, you can see some signs and symptoms of botrytis that aren't necessarily quite so readily recognizable, but they are in fact um, part of the botrytis symptoms. Um, so best ways to prevent this um, non-chemically would be regular scouting. Um, you especially with botrytis want to look on like lower leaves and inside the crown, especially if you have really dense plants, they tend to be uh, the, the foliage in there tends to be infected most. It doesn't dry out as quickly. There's not as much air movement around there. Um, and then it's also important to use preventative sprays if the environment is especially conducive. Um, good adequate space around plants is going to be beneficial, both in the sense that it is going to allow better air movement, uh, which can help to dry stuff out and help to prevent the spores from germinating in the first place. And then also if you're doing preventative or controlling sprays, and you have better space between your plants, you're going to get better spray contact when your spray team goes through or you go through to spray the plant material. Um, and then again, like I've mentioned, a lot of these preventative things are going to kind of be like I'm going to a broken record just because a lot of them are going to be the same for different crops. But it really is important to get that organic matter off um, so that your sanitizing agents can work and so that your um, overwintering structures from the various pathogens are cleaned up and removed for, from your greenhouse or other production areas. Um, so some other prevention techniques, um, removing spent flowers, if you have the time and labor to do so, is a good thing because um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen if you have flowers that fall, the petals shatter down into the plant canopy, that's a, a really good source of uh, botrytis set in for the, the rest of the plant. And then it'll spread from those flowers or from those petals on into the foliage. Um, and then there are some things you can do variety selection wise. Um, a lot of plants that have been bred to have or incidentally have thicker, tougher foliage are going to have better resistance to botrytis than thinner foliage of the same types of plants would. So Heuchera velosa hybrids would be a good example of that. Um, Heuchera velosa's uh, hybrids tend to have just a, a tougher, thicker uh, structure to the foliage and the stems. Um, they're going to be more resistant than a Heuchera variety that has less velosa background in it. Um, same thing with hostas. If you have hostas that have been bred or are slug resistant, um, that they have thicker foliage for uh, to resist feeding from slugs and snails, they're also going to be uh, less prone to botrytis infection. Um, interspecific peonies is another example. So there's, um, there's several things that you can do um, to select varieties that will be uh, less prone. Um, and then chemical wise, um, there's a number of different chemicals that can be used to prevent and or try to control uh, botrytis. Like I said earlier, it's always easier to prevent than it is to actually control once you have a, uh, a disease in your crop. But um, chlorothalonil products, phenhexamid, iprotione, thiophanate methyl, uh, you can read the list here, it goes on. And then at the bottom there, I included calcium sprays. Um, there was some work done um, a few years ago. I Probably a lot of you uh, saw, they were even on like the front cover of some of our trade magazines showing where some work had been done by Dr. Faust and, and colleagues and students um, with using calcium sprays to actually help increase um, plants' toughness or resistance to botrytis. So the image that I put on there is from some of their work just showing um, petunias where the inoculated control, you can see they were just devastated by botrytis on the flowers. Um, the one on the far right there was actually uh, fungicide sprays. And they're definitely better, but they've still got some spotting and issues on the foliage. And then it's a little hard to see on the slide, depending on how big they look for you. But the one in the middle there had some calcium sprays, and they really look quite good and quite clean. So just something to think about. Um, 
it's going to, you know, rates and everything are going to vary. I would um, look into Dr. Faust's work and or look on your calcium uh, labels to see rates and stuff for different crops. But it's something to think about uh, that's another method beyond, like, strictly chemical applications. Okay, next is leaf spots. So leaf spots um, can be caused by a variety of different pathogens. Uh, Septoria, Cercospora, Alternaria, Anthracnose are some of your most common fungal pathogens. And then also bacterial pathogens can cause leaf spotting symptoms such as Pseudomonas and Xanthomonas. Um, so a lot of these different pathogen organisms create similar symptoms. Um, it can be hard to distinguish them by eye. This is where, and with any of these other diseases as well, sending samples into your local, you know, university lab or whatever, whatever lab you use is really beneficial to make sure that you're getting the correct diagnosis because the correct diagnosis um, in turn is going to affect what sprays you can apply to actually have efficacy. If you're spraying the wrong chemicals, you may not get any control whatsoever if they're not ones that are effective against the pathogen that you actually have. Um, so spotting on the foliage, a lot of times there's well-defined margins um, around the edges of the spotting. Um, all of these pathogens do also overwinter in infected debris. So again, keep your greenhouses clean. Uh, so septoria um, is one of these that is typically host specific. Um, so if you have septoria on certain types of crops, you're not necessarily going to get it spreading to other types of crops if they're not related. Uh, so that's always nice because you don't have something that's just going to infect everything you have unless you're growing them on a crop. Um, again, this one spreads via water, so it does need that moisture and higher humidity to germinate and spread actively. Uh, this one tends to be causing small brown lesions. Um, a lot of times they're either rounded or angular. And a lot of times one of the diagnosing things that can help you say, okay, well, I do have one of these leaf spot organisms, um, is a lot of times there's like a whitish necrotic center to your spot. So they may look brownish on the edges and have kind of a white or light gray center to them. Um, and then actually on Echinacea and Rudbeckia, uh, Septoria presents itself as purple spotting, or then once it gets worse, they kind of coalesce into larger purple areas. So I know you've all seen this on like Rudbeckia out in the landscape. It's definitely a huge issue, issue with Rudbeckia, uh, both in production and in the landscape. Um, so that uh, purple blotching on Rudbeckia is caused by Septoria. Um, another one of the fungal leaf spot diseases is Cercospora. Um, so, again, this is another one that spreads via water and wind, needs moisture, um, kind of similar symptoms, purplish, brown or black spotting, a lot of times with that necrotic center. Sometimes you can also get a yellow halo. Um, and then when, if you get severe infections, they can really cause, like, overall yellowing and defoliation and poor growth of the plant. Alternaria is another one. Um, some of these are going to be host specific, but other species actually have a wider host range. Um, and again, spreading via water and air. Um, this one not only overwinters in uh, plant debris, but also can overwinter on seeds. Um, and then another kind of leaf spot organism is anthracnose. Um, anthracnose is actually caused by more than one genus of fungal pathogen. Um, probably the most common one is Coletotrichum. Um, and symptoms are going to include dark spots, sunken lesions. Sometimes they morph together and really almost look like a blight on the foliage. Uh, wind and splashy water again spread this. Um, and again, this is another one that can overwinter both in debris and in seeds. And then you have your bacterial leaf spots. So these are a little bit different. These are caused by a bacterial organism, so they're not going to be controlled by the same chemical methodology that will control your fungal pathogens. Um, and they also tend to look a little bit different. So Pseudomonas tends to be um, kind of reddish brown spots. A lot of times these do have that yellow halo too. Um, and then Xanthomonas is usually more of an angular spotting. They're usually limited by the veins of the plants. Sometimes you do get halos with those as well. And your bacterial pathogens tend to prefer um, warm, wet weather, where a lot of, not all, but a lot of your fungal pathogens tend to prefer cooler, wet weather. So here's just some photos. Um, you can see some of the mainly affected perennials would be like Phlox, Rudbeckia, Heuchera, um, Hetera tends to get uh, bacterial leaf spotting. Pasta tends to be one that can get anthracnose. Um, you can see the dianthus crop there with alternaria um, on the foliage, which um, is one that presents on dianthus as kind of like a reddish purple spotting. So things to look out for on some of those crops. 
Um, a couple more examples. So here you've got some Phlox paniculata with septoria, and there's your notorious rudbeckia with the purple spotting and blotching on it. Um, and then your bacterial leaf spotting. So you can see there um, bacterial leaf spots on heterohelix um, and then also on geraniums. Both of these crops are going to be one of your more susceptible crops to uh, BLS. Prevention techniques. Um, so really these are going to be pretty darn similar to what I talked about before with Botrytis. So regular scouting, preventative sprays, adequate spacing and air circulation, um, and cleaning up your greenhouse. Um, and then your control methods for some of these are going to be similar. Um, your chlorothalonil products, um, azoxystrobin, um, stuff like that. The, the main difference, and I think it's on the next slide here. No, it's not. But um, your bacterial uh, pathogens will not be controlled by these same products. So they will be um, helped to be prevented or somewhat controlled by things such as um, cease or agromycin. There's a very different set of chemical products um, that work against bacteria. Okay, next uh, disease is blights. So blights can be caused by Xanthomonas, Rhizoctonia, and Phytophthora mainly. Um, you can see Xanthomonas is on there again uh, because it, it can uh, um, cause bacterial leaf spotting, but then um, under cooler weather conditions, sometimes those leaf spots will start to merge together, take over more surface area of the leaves. Um, the leaves overall become chlorotic, wilty, the plant defoliates. So once it's progressed to this stage, it's really a blight. It's no longer just leaf spotting. Um, and Rhizoctonia is actually another pathogen that can cause two different kind of types of diseases. So right here you can see it uh, causing aerial blight but then it can also cause rots, which we'll talk about later. Um, so Rhizoctonia is a soil-borne fungal pathogen. Um, it's going to be naturally occurring in a lot of your outdoor soils, typically not in soilless media. So if you're growing in soilless media, as long as you don't have contamination from somewhere else, if you're growing on the floor, that can be a source of contamination. Um, but you're typically not going to find it present in soilless media, um, assuming it's you know correctly sterilized and all that by the producers. Um, this uh, organism does have a wide host range, um, and where you see it most that you're going to get aerial blight is if you've got foliage that is going to be contacted with your soil or uh, media, it can get up onto the foliage, and that's where it can cause the blight. So whether it's by contact of the leaves with the soil or splashing of soil particles up onto the foliage, that's where you get your pathogen on the leaves and get your aerial blight set in. Um, so the blight looks like water-soaked lesions a lot of the times. Um, you can get uh, mycelium that form that actually look like webbing. Um, so it can look like there's, you know, spider webs or, or mite webbing or whatever have you on the leaves, but it's actually caused by the mycelium. Um, and then ultimately necrosis and death of the plant if you don't uh, do something about it. This is one of the fungal pathogens that actually prefers higher temperatures. So where a lot of the fungal pathogens like it cooler and wet, this one is actually going to be more prevalent in the summer. It likes it between about 70 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, there you see a, a picture of it on, uh, on Catharanthus annual flowering vinca. Um, I couldn't really find any good pictures of it on perennials, but you can kind of see where it tends to, or I'm sorry, this is Phytophthora now. This is a disease that tends to affect um, kind of, various parts of the plant. So part of the plant may still look healthy, but you've got these different branches or, or parts of the plant that you can see the disease on. Um, so this one, um, again, is one that causes both blights and rots. Um, it is a not actually a true fungal organism. It's actually a, a organism that's similar, but in a different kingdom. Um, and this one will cause blackish, brownish stem lesions, um, stem and foliar death. Like I said, it's a lot of times kind of patchy or only on certain parts of the plant. Um, and this, this pathogen has swimming zoospores that spread through the water to infect healthy tissue. So this is another one that does infect or prefer humid um, and warm weather to infect. Um, and again, this one will survive long, long periods of time in infected debris. Um, and also it'll, it has oospores that will survive in the soil long term.
Um, so some of your commonly infected perennials um, would be English ivy, Phlox paniculata. Um, so you can kind of see some of the webbing in the central photo there um, and some of the, the blight or, you know, coalesced lesions on the foliage. Laura, before you uh, go on to the next uh, topic, yes. uh, we're actually, well, you're, no, you're going to get into prevention techniques yeah. next. Go ahead and do that, then I'm going to have a question for you. Okay. Okay, so I'm not going to go through all these. They're basically the same as what I've covered on the other ones. Um, and then here are some of your chemical prevention methods. Um, so there you can see some of the, um, the chemicals that will be more effective against your uh, bacterial pathogens. So the teeth, which is a, a bacillus product, um, the streptomycin, which is agromycin, and then all the ones listed below it there are going to be more effective against um, the different fungal pathogens. All right. Mary uh, from uh, Minnesota wants to know if you've seen blights or fungal disease issues with prairie drop seed or little blue stem um, and wonders if you have any fungal recommendations, preventative recommendations for grass production in general. Um, I have not personally seen any issues on those crops um, with blights or, or fungal pathogens in particular, um, like more so than other grasses. Um, but again, a lot of the same prevention methods that I've been talking about, um, you know, if you're, if you're growing them indoors, make sure you've got some good air movement in your greenhouse. Um, make sure you, if you're, you know, trimming them back or something to go into overwintering, make sure you're sanitizing your tools, make sure you're sanitizing your production space between, um, between crops. Um, and then you can use any of the, um, not the the two the Caesar agromycin, but any of the chemicals listed below here. Um, you could really, if you've been having an issue with it, I would put them into like a rotation as a preventative spray. So um, when you're spraying, you want to make sure that you're rotating between chemical classes so that you don't get resistance buildup in your pathogen to the chemistries. Um, so just look through the labels and see, make sure you're rotating them based on the label recommendations, and um, hopefully those things combined can help to prevent the disease from being too big of a problem for you. All right. Very good. Okay. Uh, moving along. Uh, so mildews is the next kind of class of, of pathogens we're going to talk about. So um, there are two different types of mildews that are different from each other. Um, one of these is, of course, powdery mildew. Um, so this is caused by erysiphy. Phylactinia, Podosphera are the main um, species that are general that cause this. Um, and the symptoms, of course, are a white powdery coating um, if it's been sporulating. Um, also, yellowing or discoloration um, and leaf distortion can all be signs of uh, powdery mildew. This pathogen is typically host specific, um, and this is one that does prefer, uh, prefer warm and humid weather. Um, and again, it overwinters in infected debris. Um, downy mildew is caused by different organisms, um, so these are actually not true fungi. These are more closely related to algae, um, but Plasmapara and Paranospora are the two main um, pathogens that cause downy mildew. And symptoms on these um, include, or with this, this pathogen, includes yellow or gray, grayish brown spotting, um, typically on the upper side of the leaves. Um, they're often contained within the veins of the plant. Um, and then whitish or grayish colonies form on the underside of the leaves when the when the pathogen starts to sporulate. This is another one that's typically host specific. So if you have it on one crop, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can get it on another crop if they're not related. Um, and this one tends to um, be most apt to have an outbreak during about your 50 to 75 degree Fahrenheit temperature range. Um, and again, this one's going to like wet conditions, high relative humidity for its best chances to spread and infect your plants. Um, and it overwinters in infected debris as well. So some of your most common crops and perennials that are going to be infected by powdery mildew would be your monarda, phlox, sedum. Um, so you can see on the sedum there, um, sedum tends to show powdery mildew through the scabbing. So it's a little bit hard to see maybe in this photo. But you can get things that don't really look like powdery mildew on other crops. They really get this kind of scabby look on a sedum. 
And then downy mildew, um, a lot of perennials that are, in, or different perennials that are infected would be Budlia, Coreopsis, Geraniums, Phlox, Salvia, Veronica can all get it. Um, so again, um, some of the classic symptoms or ones that everybody knows are when you see kind of the fuzzy sporulation, um, but there are other symptoms leading up to that, such as some discoloration you can see there um, on the Budlia, um, or just overall kind of the plant not doing well, um, kind of some distortion or stunted growth leading up to that sporulation, which happens during that time of high, uh, high relative humidity and high moisture content. Uh, prevention techniques, um, a lot of these are going to be similar, um, you know, adequate spacing, regulating your humidity. Um, if you're growing in a greenhouse, you know, if, you're, if your humidity gets up above about 80%, try to purge that out, um, irrigating in the morning, sanitation. And then there's a lot of things that you can do variety selection wise. Um, a lot of the newer genetics breeders have been working towards coming up with varieties that are resistant to mildews. Um, you see that out on the market in all different types of crops. Um, so phlox, um, rather than going with phlox paniculatas, a lot of the interspecific type of phlox have better resistance to mildews. Um, so some of the, um, the fashionably early series that Walters Gardens has put out, um, also the opening act series from Proven Winners are both, both good interspecific phlox that have better disease resistance than a straight paniculata does. Um, same thing with Monarda. There's been some different species of Monarda bred into some of the newer genetics that um, cause the plants to have better resistance to these diseases. Um, so the Pardon My series, the Sugar Buzz series, the Leading, Leading Lady series are all examples of these. Um, and some of the newer pulmonary genetics um, have been bred to just be bigger, more vigorous, more durable plants. And they also tend to have better resistance to um to the mildew pathogens. So Twinkle Toes, Pretty and Pig are a couple recent examples of that. Um, and then some chemical prevention and control methods. Um, so your strobilurins will work against both of these. Um, Eagle and Strike are both going to be really good for powdery mildew. Um, Stature is a good one towards downy mildew or that works against downy mildew. Uh, Camelot is another good one. Uh, so another type of pathogen is rust. So rust is caused by some different genera, um, Puccinia, Coleoporium, Promidium, Euromyces are all examples. Um, these can be difficult to diagnose early on. Um, they kind of start out as light colored spotting on the foliage. Sometimes they can almost look like thrip damage. Um, but then eventually, once the blisters uh, form on the underside of the foliage, that's when you can really tell, oh, yeah, I've got rust, because those little blisters or pustules um, will be rusty colored. Um, they'll break open and they'll release those spores. So if you ever see some, you know, light yellowish or uh, lighter colored spotting that you maybe th think is thrip damage, just take a close look as you're scouting, because it could, in fact, be rust on the crops that are susceptible to rust. Um, so rust is actually a pathogen that is parasitic. It requires its host to live and reproduce. Um, so it's not typically going to kill your crop, but it definitely makes it, um, you know, performance wise, it's going to be poor and you don't want to be trying to sell plants that are covered in rust, obviously. So uh, this one is typically host specific. So there's um, some main perennial crops that are susceptible to it. It's not, you know, if you've got it on a daylily, it's not necessarily going to infect um, a hollyhock. They are caused by different organisms. Um, rusts are mainly spread by wind. When those pustules open and the spores come out, those uh, spores are carried on wind currents or air currents. Um, and again, this one does uh, overwinter and in infected debris. Um, the good news for northern daylily growers is that daylily rust only overwinters in about zone seven um, or warmer temps. So like where I am up in Michigan, we don't have a problem with daylily rust overwintering from one year to the next because we get too cold for it. Um, so commonly infected uh, perennials with rust would be your daylilies or hemorrhocalis. That's definitely one that um, is gonna be varietal. Some varieties are more prone than others. Um, panicum and some other ornamental grasses tend to be prone to it. Veronica is one to watch out for. 
Um, also, nephophia or red hot poker plant is one that can get rust. Um, so you can kind of see the variations between just the kind of lighter foliar spotting like you see on the daylily there up to where you actually see on the right-hand side there um, on both Panicum and Veronica, the actual pustules on the underside of the leaves that are more that rusty orange color. Uh, prevention techniques. So a big one with rust, because it can be varietal, um, is to avoid varieties that are more prone to infection. So if you're trying to grow some daylilies and you're in an area where, um, especially in an area where rust will overwinter, uh, or even if you're trying to grow a spring crop and you just want to make sure that you are clean, um, use varieties that aren't as prone to infection. Insist on clean stock, too, at the liner level. Whoever you're getting your plants from, make sure that they're coming in clean. Um, scout the material as it's coming in and as you're growing the crop itself. Um, again, maintain adequate spacing, regulate and purge your humidity out. Um, same types of controls as the other uh, pathogens we've talked about earlier. Um, and then chemical preventions and control methods on rust would be against trebilurins, um, eagle, mural, orchestra, and strike are all good um, effective chemicals against rust. Okay, root crown and stem rots. Um, so there's a few different pathogens that will cause your different uh, rot pathogens. Um, Rhizoctonia, Pythium, Phytophthora, Flaviopsis, Claritinia, Arwinia are some of your main ones. Um, a lot of the first symptoms that you're going to see, depending on the pathogen, are just going to be stunting or yellowing and wilting as you're looking at your crop. Um, and if you pick up and unpot, you know, pull those out of the pots to look at your roots, that's when you're going to see, oh, this is why they look like this, because there's the roots are not healthy. The roots are brown or mushy or they're not doing well. And that you see it first, maybe on the top of the plant, um, just because you're not always able to look at the roots unless you're pulling them out on a regular basis, which you should all be doing. Um, so like I said, your infected parts of the plants, the roots, the crown, the stem, wherever your rot is uh, localized, you're going to have that kind of brown, mushy symptoms. Um, there are some that have more distinctive symptoms. So Pythium is a good example of that. Pythium, a lot of times, if you uncan your plant and look at the roots, you're going to see that the kind of the outer sheath on the root will kind of pull off if you pull at it gently, and you'll just kind of have the like inner core of the root left. That can be a good indication that you're dealing with Pythium. Um, and then dark root tips or areas on the roots um, can be a good indication that you're dealing with the Laviopsis, which is also known as black root rot. Um, so here we just have some um, photos. So Rhizoctonia, you can see in the upper left corner there, um, infecting salvia. Um, if I top the root rot on peony, um, you can see the Laviopsis on some uh, young Tiarella production. Uh, okay, there we go. Um, Pythium, I, I couldn't really find any good photography with uh, perennials, but um, you can see that lower uh, black stem on the annual geranium there. Um, that is a good indication you're dealing with pythium. It's like black leg rot, it's also called. Um, Erwinia is one that you see on iris, so um, just be looking for those symptoms. Um, and again, some of the same types of uh, preventative techniques for controlling it or preventing it. Um, another good one to do with your rots is to make sure you are scouting for and managing um, if you have built up a population of fungus gnats and short flies um, because they, the larvae will be feeding on your roots and can spread it very rapidly if there's um, if there's one plant that have, have it. Um, another thing to be cognizant of is if you're sub-irrigating, um, sub-irrigation can really rapidly spread root rot pathogens. Um, if you're flooding a whole bay of something and one plant in that bay has pythium or has another root rot organism um, and you're running that sub-irrigation water that comes in contact with the whole crop, you can very quickly spread that pathogen. Um, so here's some of the chemicals that are effective against some of these different rots. Um, a lot of these are going to be um, applied as drenches for controlling that. That way you get good contact with the crown or the roots or the st lower stem, the parts of the plant that are infected by the rot versus 
some of your foliar pathogen diseases, you're going to spray uh, because that's where the infection is. That's where you're going to have the most contact um, with the spray. But these, a lot of them you want to actually drench on. So thiophanate methyl um, is a good one for some of the diseases. Um, some of them only have certain, you know, certain pathogens are affected by certain chemicals. Um, pythium is one also that has had a lot of resistance um, in past years. So subdue max is, was a great chemical. Um, and, and some places still is against pythium, but there's also a lot of places in the country where pythium or different pythium strains are now resistant to subdue max and growers have to turn to things like Truban or Terrazol um, to eradicate that or control it. Okay, wilts. So wilts are caused mainly by Ferticillium, Fusarium, um, Phytophthora, and Pseudomonas. Um, so these can be either fungal or bacterial in the case of Pseudomonas. Um, and they actually clog the vascular system of the plant. So you can kind of see in the photo there where the whole like xylem and phloem of the plant gets infected um, and clogged by these organ uh, pathogens. And that's why you see wilting as one of the main symptoms because the, the water, the moisture can't get up and down the plant. Um, same with nutrients. Um, so symptoms do um, tend to include yellowing and wilting of all or part of the plant, depending on where in the vascular pathway that pathogen is present, and then overall stunted growth. Um, so fusarium is one that tends to be a little bit more host specific than some of the others. Um, it tends to be problematic, especially on a stilby, echinacea, dicentra, sedum, nepeta. Uh, verticillium can be more common on things like peony, rudbeckia, salvia, phlox. Um, Phytophthora can be really big on lavender. Um, also, sedum and euphorbia can be uh, infected. Um, and then some of the chemical preventions. So, fusarium is a pathogen that is notoriously difficult to control. Um, but you can use things like fludioxanil or, or zoxystrobin, um, iprotione to try to help control it. Um, really, if you have fusarium in your crop, you need to rogue out um, any infected plant. And really, this is true for anything. If you, if you have pythium in a crop and you see certain plants um, that you know are infected, your best bet is really to get rid of them so that you help prevent the spread to other plants. Um, but also very true with, with fusarium. Um, Verticillium is also another one that can be difficult to control. Uh, luckily, this is going to be more common in um, field production or in the landscape than it will be in um, actual greenhouse or container production. But it's it's not unheard of. Um, and there you can see, I'm just going to kind of rush through because I see we've only got a few minutes left before questions. But some of the um, controls, uh, chemical controls against these diseases. And since this will be archived, you can go back and see these later. Uh, so viruses and phytoplasmas. Um, so viruses, there are so many different viruses. There are just a ton of different viruses that can affect plant material. Some of the most common ones would be like mutations of the aquatic spot virus, uh, tobacco mosaic virus, virus X, which is um, gaining more knowledge in the industry and in um, consumers a little bit, but still relatively unknown, I think, among people. Um, cucumber mosaic virus. So Symptoms are really going to depend on which virus you're looking at, but it, it, there's a wide range of different viruses that can be um, indicative of, or of symptoms that can be indicative of viruses, but they can be like plant stunting, yellowing, um, ring-like spots, mosaic-like patterns on the leaves, uh, leaf deformities, blackening of stems, plant distortion. There's, I mean, there's just a lot of different things that you can get depending on the virus uh, pathogen. And then aster yellows is another thing that tends to be lumped in with viruses. It's not actually a virus. It's actually caused by a bacterium-like organism called a phytoplasma, but it causes symptoms that are similar to a virus. Um, symptoms from aster yellows tend to include um, virescence, which is like greening of parts of the plant that aren't typically green. So you may have an echinacea with a pink flower, um, but all of a sudden your flowers don't look pink anymore. They look kind of greenish and kind of off color. Um, and that can be a sign that you have aster yellows. Um, also, flower deformities are um, uh, an indicative symptom. And just overall chlorosis and stunting can also be a sign of uh, aster yellows. And as the name suggests, um, aster yellows is found within the Asteraceae family. Um, so any of your aster type uh, family plants, 
your Rudecchias, your Echinacea, your Asters, um, Marigolds, and you know, anything that's in that family can get infected by Aster yellows. So like I said, um, a lot of different viruses, also a lot of different species that are affected, depends on the virus, um, but you can see some of the symptoms here. Um, leaf curling, spotting, um, and hosta, hosta virus X can cause what you call um, ink bleeding, where some of the darker parts of the leaf uh, may appear in parts that are supposed to be lighter. Um, you can also get some funny crinkling um, in parts of the leaf that are supposed to be smooth. So just oddball symptoms that you need to look out for. And if you're at all um, suspicious, either send it into a lab or there are some um, viruses that can be tested in-house with Agdea strips um, if you're concerned. Oops, I think I, oh no, here we go. Okay, um, so and like I said, members of the Aster family are going to be uh, affected by Aster yellows. So prevention techniques, uh, your main thing here, um, you do wanna insist on 100% virus index liners when you're buying in your inputs. Um, also inspect your product when it comes in, inspect your liners, inspect your cuttings, um, have some Agdea strips in-house for some of your more common ones. And if you're at all um, suspicious, do a test right there. And you know, that way you know within like 15 minutes if you do in fact have a, a problem or not, or, and you can isolate those cuttings, um, get rid of them, put in a claim if need be, um, and make sure that you don't in introduce that out into your entire greenhouse. Some of the things like, uh, like TMV can infect over 200 different species. So you can wipe out your whole greenhouse um, if you aren't careful of introducing something into your greenhouse that way. Um, again, sanitation is critical. And then a lot of these viruses are spread. Some of them can be spread mechanically through like pinching, um, breaking plant material, but a lot of them are also spread through insect transmission, um, through things such as thrips and aphids that um, have like sucking mouth parts um, that feed on the plant that way and transmit the virus from an infected plant to a healthy plant. Um, and then leaf hoppers is the source of spread for aster yellows. So be scouting and controlling these insect pests. Um, chemical control. There is really nothing you can do chemical wise once you have a virus or phytoplasma. Um, you're just going to have to throw those plants out. Um, the main thing is chemically that you can do is with sanitation. So there's different things, Fysan, Vircon, that you can use on your you know, tools, your equipment, um, on your bench surfaces to prevent spread if you had a crop that was infected to your next crop. Um, you can also use dry milk. It kind of sounds funny, but if you use uh, like reconstituted nonfat dry milk, you mix it with water, you spray that. Um, that can actually prevent um, viruses because it binds to the, the same site that a virus would bind to. So if you have... Um, the dry milk sprayed on there, then the vir viral pathogen can't bind and infect the plant. Um, and then, like I said, manage your pest populations, make sure that different pests that can vector these viruses and phytoplasmas um, are controlled to a minimum level of, of population size um, and limit your mechanical transmission. If you're, um, if you're susceptible that a crop might have a virus, you know, verify that it doesn't before you go in and pinch your whole crop and spread it to, uh, you know, to the other plants. Okay, bacterial galls. So bacterial galls, um, hence the name, are caused by bacterial pathogens. So there's a couple different ones out there. Um, crown gall is caused by agrobacterium, and leafy gall is caused by rhodococcus. Um, there's still, I think, a lot to learn about these uh, pathogens, um, but some stuff that I was reading indicated that the thinking right now is that these um, perhaps are affecting plant hormonal balance, so they're almost causing symptoms like um, cytokinins would, where there's like a proliferation. Um, a lot of the, um, the cells will pro proliferate and you get this like little mass of plant tissue that you wouldn't normally see. Um, these will spread both via water and also on infected tools. So here you can see, it's a little hard to see um, on the screen here, I think, but um, there's actually a fair number of different crops that'll get it. Um, the pictures here are both of leucanthemum. Leucanthemum do tend to be 
more um, sensitive or more apt to getting the leafy gall or rotococcus. Um, but other things can get bacterial gall too, or runcus, campanula, echinacea, the list goes on. Um, but you can kind of see the proliferation of like small leafy shoots down at the base of the plants there. Um, and then here you can see the crown gall on Budlia, um, and again some leafy gall on the heucra. Um, so your main prevention techniques with this are going to be making sure that you inspect your plant material, um, inspect um, both at young plant stages and finished stages. Sometimes your young plants will look nice and healthy um, and you think you're good. And then all of a sudden later you come in and you look at your finished crop or you're about ready to ship and all of a sudden you can see it. So um, it can come up at all different stages of production. Um, again, be vigilant about sanitizing. Um, rogue out and destroy any of your infected plants. Don't compost them. If you have a compost pile or whatever, actually like bag them and destroy them, get rid of them. Um, and then one variety in particular that we have seen that tends to be just even more susceptible would be Lucanthemum beckys. So um, some of the newer genetics are not as prone to galling as Becky is. Laura, while you're there, you mentioned sanitation and I've noticed three or four or five questions come in just near the end here, all related to sanitation, okay. hard surfaces, tools between crops. Uh, you mentioned clean grow. Mm -hmm. What what sanitation uh, practices do you like specifically? Products do you like specifically at uh, Walters? Yeah, so um, we do like clean grow, um, especially when it comes to galls. So a lot of our crops will use um, things such as uh, like rubbing alcohol, isopropyl alcohol. If we're um, switching between um, varieties, we always make sure that we sanitize. Like we don't necessarily sanitize between every single plant, but if you're, if you're trimming or doing something on a block of one variety and you switch varieties, all of our uh, workers are supposed to spray their tools down with alcohol. Um, but when it comes to galls, we do recommend clean grow. Um, we recommend, um, actually, a, a soak of, um, like knives or cutters or other material tools that you're using. Um, I think it's like a 10 minute soak. You could read the label to get um, exact recommendations. Um, and then we will also spray down for bench surfaces. Um, so yeah, those are kind of the main two that we would be, would use for like galls and fungal pathogens. Okay, thanks. Um, so kind of like with viruses, uh, once you have gall, there is no chemical control that will get rid of it. Um, there is something, um, this has mainly been used so far in like the woody uh, production, um, but there's a, a, a product called Agrobacterium Radiobacter K84, um, or Galtrol is the trade name, um, that can be sprayed on roots or used as a root dip to prevent to help with prevention. But like I said, that's mainly been in the woody um, industry. I uh, plan to do something, you know, trial-wise with it on some of our more susceptible crops such as leucanthemum and see if it has efficacy against galling on that. I haven't done it yet though, so I can't speak to whether or not it really works on those. Um, Copper-based fungicides can also help to, to control the spread. Um, and then again, sanitizing agents, but there's not any chemical where if you have gall, you can come and spray it over your crop or drench your crop and, and be uh, confident that it's going to be controlled or, or eliminated. You just need to, uh, rogue out and destroy that plant material. Okay, I think we're getting to the end here. Um, so insects and other pests. So um, a lot of different pests that can be problematic in production. Um, I'm sure you've all seen and dealt with a lot of these aphids, fungus gnat and shorefly, uh, Japanese beetle, thrips, white fly, the list goes on and on. Um, some shots of damage and, and infection or egg laying and different things here. Um, so some things are more easily recognizable than others. Um, we all probably know how to recognize spider mites. You know, you can see the mites crawling, you can see the webbing, but you can see the photo here of the leucanthemum with broad mites. And broad mites can be a little bit more tricky to Diagnose. A lot of times you, you can't see them 
um, but you see like distortion of the plant, but you're not sure what's going on. Um, on certain varieties, that can be an indication of broad mite damage. Um, the central picture there shows some leaf hopper damage. Um, leaf hoppers love to get on salvia, perennial salvia. So if you ever see, and again, it's a little bit hard to see in this photo here, at least on my side of the monitor, um, but it just, it almost looks kind of like mite damage, but not. Um, and then if you turn those leaves over, you'll see lots of little leaf hoppers. So, um, and then of course, white fly eggs and um, such to look for. Um, some more symptoms, um, mite damage on the geranium there, uh, four line plant bug feeding damage on various things. They like lucanthemum, um, especially if you have greenhouses that are open or production, open production, you can have issues with those and Japanese beetles and other pests that are more thought of as kind of outdoor pests. Um, and then the middle picture on the bottom there is actually aphid damage on Veronica. Um, that was one that Paul Pilon put into his email blast uh, oh, a week or so ago um, for, you know, what do you think is going on with this plant? Um, but that can actually be a symptom of aphids um, if you have that kind of curling and gnarly look to leaves that would normally be more smooth or flat. Uh, pest prevention techniques. So regular scouting, make sure you've got somebody or you yourself are out there scouting regularly. Um, you can use sticky cards and sticky tape. Um, to not only help trap some of those guys, but also you can go and then look at your sticky cards or sticky tape and see what you're catching. Um, so you can see the one photo there. You know, there's not just cards. You can get like large strips that you hang between posts in your greenhouse. Um, or I've seen people hang large strips like that from booms and, and run the booms back and forth across your crop. Um, also preventative sprays. Um a lot of people use biologicals. We use biologicals at Walters. So you can see the other picture there, or it's actually shown in both pictures. There's little sachets. And then crops that we know tend to be um, susceptible to certain things will put out these little sachets uh, that house little populations of mites that are predatory and will feed on thrip larvae or whatever different, you know, some of them control thrips, some of them control um, other organisms. Um, and then also make sure that you're looking at your plant material when you get it in, whether you're getting in cuttings or liners or pre-finished material um, or bulbs or whatever you're growing. Um, look at it when it comes in and make sure that you don't see any indication of disease pathogens or insect pests. Um, I'm not going to run off through these just because we're at like three minutes to the hour, it looks like. But here's some different controls for some of the different pest organisms. You can look at all these later once it's archived. Um, and then other pitfalls just quickly. Um, so some things can um, confuse growers. They can, you know, look like pathogens, but maybe they're really nutrient deficiencies or phytotoxicity from chemical sprays or just environmental conditions. Maybe your pH is off. Maybe you've got poor drainage and you're, um, you're getting yellowing on your plants or you've got temperature extremes can cause weird things to happen in plants. Um, so just things to be aware of. Again, I'm not gonna go through all these one by one, but just know that you know maybe it's a disease, maybe it's an insect or other pest, but maybe it's actually something cultural that you need to keep in mind as you're seeing funny things come up on your crops. Um, again, just inspect your incoming plant material for abnormalities. Make sure that when you are applying fertilizers, um, herbicides, pesticides, make sure that you're following the label recommendations. And then also make sure that you're uh, managing your moisture. Um, don't overwater, don't underwater. Um, just try to maintain a healthy balance there. Um, and again, there's not really anything chemically you can do for these. It's more just um, cultural awareness and um, making sure that you're growing your crops to the, the standard that they need to be grown to. Um, of course, there are things you can do chemically to adjust your pH uh, and nutrition. So prevention is best. Make sure you're scouting, make sure you're cleaning your environment, um, monitor and, and maintain uh, good levels of moisture and humidity and spray preventatively or put out biological controls. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> Any questions? There's a hundred questions. I and I apologize for leaving my chair twice. My my office light goes off automatically if I sit too still. I noticed Normally that. I'm very active, times, so it yeah. puts me in the dark there. Let's let's go through a few of them here. Okay. Uh, I know people are waiting patiently. Uh, Carol uh, 
Actually, this one came in before we even started. You were going to type an answer, and then we ran out of time. Yeah. She says her uh, Brunera, Brunera leaves look necrotic in pots by summer. Any hints to keeping the, the foliage looking healthy? I actually do have a hint for that. So that is something that Brunera um, has been known to do, uh, both in pots and in the landscape. A lot of times by later in the season, it'll start to look necrotic and, and just kind of bad. Um, and the thing I would recommend there would be actually to use some of the newer genetics that are out or coming out on the market. Uh, we at uh, Walters Gardens Proven Winners have actually got two new varieties. Um, we're going to be showing them at cast here in, what, a couple weeks. Um, and they will be available to purchase starting um, this coming summer after July 1 from us at Walters. Um, also from um, some other places uh, that provide peren uh, Proven Winners perennials. Um, and those are both varieties. That are, the names on them are Queen of Hearts and um, Jack of Diamonds. And they're both varieties that have better resistance to anthracnose and bacterial leaf spot, which are the main reasons you're getting that necrosis later in the summer. Um, and these are also just overall nice varieties, really largely. But those are two varieties that should have a lot better resistance to that than some of your older varieties, such as Jack Frost. Um, or other things such as that. So that would be my recommendation on Brunera would be to change your varieties. All right. How's your experience with uh, with hellebores, Laura? I have some hellebore experience. We do um, a lot of hellebore production at Walters Gardens. Good. We've got two different people asking. First, James wants to know, why the heck are they, he didn't say that. I'm just, you know, using play on words. Are they so hard to grow in over winter? Okay, well, I think the main reason that people think hellebores are hard to grow or hard to overwinter is because not everybody necessarily understands um, the life cycle or growing cycle of a hellebore. So hellebores have a very different growing cycle than most of your perennials do, uh, where most of your perennials, you know, are going to be dormant over the winter, um, become active in the spring, be growing actively through the summer, um, Hellebores are actually really active at, in the spring and again in the fall. Um, and then they actually go dormant in the summer. Um, they just have a very different type of life cycle. They're also um, evergreen. Um, so you really have to main, watch your moisture control on hellebores um, in the summer, especially. Don't overwater them. They're not actively growing. And even though they have evergreen foliage in the winter, they're not necessarily um, actively growing during that time either. The active growth times, like I said, are going to be kind of in the spring and in the fall. Um, another tip, and this isn't necessarily for overwintering, but for summer, over summering, I guess you could call it, um, would be to try to maintain a cooler root zone. Um, so one thing that we advocate is in the summertime, um, push those pots up pot tight, and that way the foliage canopy um, helps to cover the, the root zone and keep that cooler. So that can help with your um, over summering, if you will, um, over wintering, you can kind of do the same thing, push those pots up pot tight and just maintain or monitor your moisture so that you're not over watering, because that can be one of your biggest, um, problems with overwintering hellebores is that people think since they've got the foliage up, oh, we need to keep watering, keep watering, keep watering. And then you end up, uh, rotting out your, your plants basically. So, um, uh, Gary wants to know if you've got any, uh, uh, fungal spray re uh, recommendations for botrytis uh, and other leaf diseases on hellebore? Um, so a lot of the same ones are the chemicals that work against those various pathogens um, on other perennials are going to be the same ones that you would use on hellebore. So uh, botrytis, for instance, um, you can use daconel is a good one, chlorothalonel. Um, that one is one that you can get some phyto on flowers. So I would use that um, earlier in your crop when you don't have flowers open. It's also a product that is going to leave residue. Um, but if you do it earlier in your crop and then you can, you know, have it rinsed off by the time you're ready to ship. Um, there's other things. Millstop is, has good efficacy against botrytis. Um, Decreti is one that's not as good maybe as like a uh, daconel, but it does not burn your flowers and it also doesn't leave residues. So there's like a wide range of different things that can be used against botrytis. All right. I've also heard through a webinar I did on, on hellebores a while back, don't prune them. This is true. Yeah. It, it's like cutting, it's like cutting someone's arm off, yeah. cutting a leaf, a, a, a branch off of a hellebore. So don't do that. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, Rico wants to know what's the first thing you suggest to do after uncovering perennials? in the, uh, in the spring. Oh, okay. So after you're overwintering and after you take off your frost blanket, um, 
really the first thing that I would suggest would be to get a um, like a preventative broad spectrum fungicide drench on there. Um, a lot of times it's a good idea um, to put one of those on like when you're almost about to go into overwintering. So don't put it on and then like put your frost blanket right on top of it. But you know, a few weeks before you're set to go into overwintering, apply a broad spectrum fungal uh, preventative drench. And then once you uncover in the spring, that would be the first thing I would do again, because the residual isn't going to last all winter long. So now that you're uncovered and ready to start growing again, get another drench on there that'll help cover a wide range of, of issues. There you go. Julie uh, wants to know, this is interesting. Do you find the age of perennials makes them more or less susceptible to some diseases? She says she's especially thinking about Rudbeckia and Echinacea. Yeah. I, of course, you want to grow them and sell them. So you want to get them all out young. But if you, I guess if you're overwintering or you have them around for a few years or have them in a garden, that, that would change things. Yeah, uh, definitely. I do see, and it's going to depend on the pathogen. Some pathogens um, send, tend to be more likely to affect younger plants when the tissue is kind of young and fresh and not as tough. Um, other pathogens, you know, you might not see them early on. And then, yeah, as the plants get older, you do see more. So um, to me, I've seen with like Rebecca and Echinacea is that foliage gets a little bit older is when you start to see more issues on that. Um, but other things, I think Botrytis especially tends to be one that likes to get in on young tissue if it can. Um, but it'll, it'll affect old tissue as well. So it really is pathogen dependent. Um, it's also somewhat variety dependent or, or genus dependent, species dependent. All right. Barry wants to know, uh, how do you control the green fungus that you get on top of the, uh, the potting media in your pots? Ah, that's a good question. Um, that I think is every, every grower's question these days. Um, so the, the green fungus, or it's actually uh, like an algae or moss type that you usually see on the soil surface. Um, your best bet there is going to be moisture management. Um, so a lot of times if you've got that on your soil surface surface, it is a good indication that the, uh, Plants are getting overwatered or staying wet too long. Um, so I would suggest, um, you know, increased ventilation or, or air movement through HAF fans, um, trying to minimize your watering, only water when it's necessary. Make sure you're watering, like I said, with uh, preventing pathogens. It can also help to prevent that moss or algae buildup if you water in the morning and give those, the soil surface, a you know, more of a chance to dry out. Um Depending on what you're seeing green-wise on the surface, another issue can be um, liverwort, um, especially some of your longer-term crops. Um, you can develop liverwort in those. Um, liverwort it can be very difficult to control, um, but there's actually, um, if you apply rice holes to the surface of the pot, that can minimize light penetration to the liverwort, and so it can help to uh, reduce liverwort um, growth and, and spread in your containers. All right. We'll get to another question about that in a second. Uh, two folks, Monica and Jared, are both having problem with weevil on heuchera. Uh, Monica, specifically vinyl, vine weevil. Oh, boy. Larvae. Okay. Well, I have never dealt with weevil on heuchera. Um, so maybe that would be a good one if, if you could pass that along to me, Chris, and I will look into that and get back to Monica and um, others who have that same question. All right. And then... Um, I think we're going to make this the last question. Uh, Dennis wants to know, what suggestions do you recommend for top dressing perennials to battle weeds? And we've done whole, I've done whole webinars on weeds in nurseries. So you can go back to our archives for that too. But what do you say, uh, Laura? I would actually suggest rice holes there too. Um, we do that at Walter's Gardens, um, again, in some of our longer term crops um, where you've got things that are, you know, together and, and growing and it's hard to get in there and weed them, um, we will apply um, a, a layer of rice holes to the top of the pot. And again, that minimizes light penetration down there. The weeds just can't grow as well. Um, so, so that would be my main suggestion there. And it's going to be, you know, safer than trying to do like a pre-emergent or something. All right. And I'll do a little, little, a little ball publishing promotion because you had mentioned Paul Pilon's newsletter. Yeah. Uh, Perennial, um, what's it called? Perennial, you know, perennial, pulse. Per perennial pulse. Thank you. <laughs> Corey wants to know, how do I get that? Well, if you go to growertalks.com and uh, click the uh, the little link thing and you'll see a whole, there's see one for webinars 
uh, not webinars. That's what we're doing now. Uh, newsletters. And um, uh, there's nine different newsletters. And one of them is Paul Pilon's Perennial Pulse Newsletter. You can just click on that, sign up. Great information on perennial production every two weeks. He really is an, an expert. Well, it, um, we couldn't get to all. We tried to get a good uh, sampling of the different uh, questions. But if you have more or did, yours didn't get answered, and I apologize for that slide coming out funny, you can email Laura at lsr at waltersgardens.com. And uh, she's on the road. She said she probably can't get to them all right away, but she will do her darndest to answer everybody's questions. And if you have questions about things specifically from this webinar that you missed, it went by a little faster at the end because it's just so much good information. It is going to be archived um, probably within the half hour or an hour after we wrap things up and I hit the stop button. Um, you just go to the same place you signed up, growtalks.com slash webinars, and you can watch it over and over and over again. And a little bit more self-promotion. I've got two more webinars coming up in the next uh, few weeks. Uh, one called Making the Better Mix, Wood Fiber Research and the Benefits of Adding Hydrofiber. That's uh, Thursday, March 14th. And then What Makes a Growing Container Automation Friendly? That should be really interesting, too. And that's Thursday, April 18th. So, Laura, you did a great job. Tremendous good information. I hope everybody came away with uh, something that will help them with their crops this spring. Uh, but we're going to sign off now. So for, for Laura and all the other fine folks at Walters Gardens and for my, uh, my stellar ball publishing staff who work hard so I don't have to, this is Chris Beatty saying so long, everybody. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>